Brian, I got a, a, a couple questions I want to ask you, but before I do, a little bit of a statement. Mm-hmm. You know, I've read in the past that uh, when the jester in the in the in the in the court of the king, yes. when the jester gets thrown in jail or the dungeon or gets killed, mm-hmm. uh, that's when uh, people need to be careful. That's when stuff's uh, going bad, um, and. Uh, you know, That's because the rulers were always afraid of satire, mm. because humor is powerful. Well, I was going to say, um, comedy's like the it's like the last bastion of, of free speech. It's the canary in the coal mine, and uh, you know I've been a fan of comedy since I was a kid, and I can't remember a time when uh, comedy's been more under attack. I know uh, Kevin Hart uh, was taken; he wasn't allowed to present at a big award ceremony because of a tweet he did years prior. I know Dave Chappelle was under attack for. Some of his jokes, uh, Ricky Gervais, uh, you know, hammered. Um, what, what do you think is going on? Because I, I, I don't remember comedians uh, it's, ever it, being attacked. It's never. I. It, it may have never been different. Um, it's. It, it. It's just that now, the, you know, sort of the cult of the amateur. You've got everybody's got a voice, and so you can mount a lot of noise at something, but. Art has always disturbed. It's supposed to disturb. It's supposed to bother you. When when Picasso went through his cubist phase and he was painting and deconstructing the human face, etc., that was that was where Dali was was talking about bending time. After Einstein talked about the theory of relativity and times, a time was it was called Jewish science because he said time is actually relative. It's a relationship between two mathematical equations. If you're going at the speed of light, it changes or it stands still. People were like, "This is against God's word." That in itself was reflected by by uh, Dali's paintings. When when uh, I think it was Stravinsky did Rites of Spring in Paris. I think it was 19. Hundred, he had. The, the, if you ever listen to the Rites of Spring, it's this weird. Ching, ching, ching. It's like this. It's not. There's no scale to it. It's this musical. It's it's very off-putting. Like jazz. It, yeah, but <laughs> it is. It's really a weird. And then he had he had the dancers come out and they were dressed half man, half beast. They had their shirts off. It was so disturbing that there was a riot in the streets of France. They fucking lost their minds. Mm-hmm. So I think if you're, that your job as a comic is, you're welcome for that history lesson, first of all. I appreciate it. <laughs> but, but, but I think as a comic, man, it, it, the minute you start kowtowing or giving voice to you know, people who are offended, you're in deep trouble. So my my job is to just keep speaking and keep and it is you're right it's very easy to cancel people for for something they said and they were you know you are no longer allowed to say what you don't mean which is by the way something called a joke you you have to be very careful I will never be careful and I think woe to anyone who does and you're right you're right the minute we start. Uh, I, I, being, I, I, I never liked being mean. I never told gay jokes, actually, even in the 90s. And I only did that because I just didn't like making fun of somebody who was, I knew there was probably going to be gay people in my audience. It just never made me, I, it always bummed me out. Mm-hmm. I, I'd hear people using the F word and stuff. And for me, I was like, dude, there's probably like four people in the room who've been made fun of their whole life. And now you're, and they're here to laugh. And now you're making fun of them. And I never liked, that. that never got to me. I understand not being mean, but... Telling the truth, making fun of how insane this whole world is. The, the Wokeville keeps changing the rules on us. It's not enough to be not racist. Now you have to be anti-racist. Yeah, it's, right. it's, it's really, not enough to be. You have to silence is violence. You have to now. shut up and listen, but yeah. then silence is violence. So we don't know how to follow any of these. Well, you rules. know, a, a lot of the examples you brought up in the past were before we uh, really, I uh, guess, valued uh, individual liberty. Right before we had laws that said. You can, you should be able to speak however you want, um, and the the speech itself is not a crime, right? That's that happened a little later. Mm. We have that now, but it seems like it's going backwards. And you did, you mentioned something that's very interesting. You said that the Wokeville's changing speech constantly. Mm -hmm. That's a characteristic of, uh, of of Marxism. That's what they did in the Soviet Union. They would change speech so much. To the point where people were like, psychologically, like, all right, you tell us what's good and what's not good, Mm -hmm. and uh, we'll just do what you say. Uh, Does this worry you at all? Yeah. It worries me, but it also is wonderful because it gives all of us something to push back on. And it's part of the grand experiment called the United States. Remember, this this, this country is an idea. It's a a verb. It's, it's It's a beautiful idea. 
you know, the, Eric Weinstein said something so brilliant in this podcast. He said, the magic of America is you are allowed to bla- burn the flag you have no interest in burning. And that's a really powerful statement. And he's way more eloquent and smart and smarter than I am. But, but you know, I, I thought about that for a long time. And, and it does worry me. Bad ideas are always, always going to be around. And they will always be repackaged in different, uh, you know, in different ribbons and different, you know, paper, but you've got to, you've got to, you've got to recognize them. The good thing about reading history, the important thing about edu- being educated, is it teaches you the difference between a good idea and a bad idea. Mm. And there are a lot of bad ideas coming out of the universities because there's no way to implement them. There's no way to make sense of them uh, at the level of detail. There just isn't, man. No, and what's weird to me is, uh, you know, obviously, I, I, uh, fitness is my profession, and I would, when I would manage gyms, I've, do, I've been doing this for decades. Um, I'd get these trainers out of college, who had extensive degrees in biomechanics and human performance, sports medicine, and they were always terrible trainers for about two or three years because <laughs> you needed experience. And yeah, it, and, you and, did. And then, as an entrepreneur, um, you know, people coming out of business school who've never started a business. Um, they're, they're terrible compared to the kid who's been trying at business for a while. And so I feel like the universities are a bunch of people telling you in theory, never have done. Yeah, because somebody, this isn't my idea, but somebody was talking about, it might've been Douglas Murray uh, or, or Nassim Taleb. And he said, the academics are in the business of deconstructing. They're in the business of, of being on the outside and they don't do anything. They, they sit around and read and theorize. That, there's, that's fine. You need that. But what they're in the business of doing is deconstructing. They, they look at a system and they deconstruct it. They don't construct anything. The rest of us are busy trying to build a life. Think about trying to get in shape. Think about building any skill or a business. You got you to gotta construct it. It takes a long time, man. Like you got to just manage personalities and you got to look at the marketplace and come up with a product people want, figure out how to get it out there and figure out how to make sure. And then it's faulty and you got to have a recall. There's a thousand things you got to do and it's really hard to make a buck. Mm. That's not the case when you have tenure as a tenure as a professor. You're able to sit back and go, here's what's wrong. This is what if we did this? And but you're not. It's, it's exactly like what I love about fighting is that. You can be, you're a black belt in Shotokan karate, cool. You're a black belt in kung fu, whatever it is, awesome. Now get into a fucking ring and see how you can defend a double leg, motherfucker. Yeah. Or, 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 or just or get when, punched in the face. Yeah, or if you're an amazing, you're amazing at jujitsu, but then you get into, I remember a friend of mine, I mean, this really amazing jujitsu guy was kind of getting lippy with my friend who was a fighter, um, you like a real MMA fighter. And my friend looked at him and goes, hey, bro, I'm a fighter. Are you forgetting that right now? You're awesome <laughs> at jujitsu, but I'm I'm a, I'm a fighter. Yeah. It's a different thing. So you know, th- there's something very honest about about what actually works. You as a trainer know that if I come to you and I go, dude, I'm I'm you know, I only do body body you know movements and and I'm doing yoga, but I'm getting I have a toy. You would have a point. You'd be like, I know, Brian, that's all awesome, but your orthodoxy is no good here. Let me, if you want to get, mm-hmm. you want to put muscle on, there's a science to that. And you know that from years of experience. And you'd probably look at me and go, you're genetically not predisposed to put a lot of muscle on, so we got to do this, that, and the other thing. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it goes back to experience. It goes back to getting into contact with objective reality. Objective reality. You want to be a good comic? Get up in front of other comics and so, uh, in front of audiences, and you'll know when you're good because they'll laugh. Yeah, well, you know, there's there's a history of uh, for a long time. A lot of people don't know this, but academics and intellectuals being at odds with merchants, capitalists, and, and business people. Um, and I think part of that is uh, first and foremost, you're really smart. It's it's hard to see somebody who's not as smart as you figure things out and do well. So there's yeah. always that, 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 oh, you know, they, they're not that smart, but look, they're making all that money. We're over here. We know everything type of deal. And then the second thing is I think the shadow side of high intelligence is a level of narcissism to where you think you can plan everything better. Like, oh, I know they've been doing it this way for a couple hundred years. I know how to do it better. Just follow my way. It's that shadow side of intelligence. Yeah, and that's always really dicey, man, because if, you, if you're if you going to have a revolution and you want to tear down institutions that have been there a long time, what are you going to replace it with, man? Hmm. You better know what to it's replace worse. it with. usually yeah, worse. Always, or it breaks into factionalism and, and, and civil war. Hmm. This is what I worry about. You know, your institutions came about, you know, they were scaled to 
human beings and to the progress of of how we kind of learn things. It takes a long time. If you're going to start dismantling things like the police, I mean, and <clears throat> the FBI and the justice system, oh my God, mm. you better be, you better have something to replace it with. And I'm, I am not ready to do that. No, I, I revere the founding fathers. Yes, they were flawed individuals, but man, oh man, I think they solved the political problem. What's fucking amazing about this country is not just that we have a decentralization of power. No one has, no one can hold power. That the founding fathers were br- the bicameral legislature. You've got the, the executive. Executive, you've got the judicial, you've got the legislative branch. It was meant to be a slow, cumbersome process where everybody is vying for influence. That's how they stay out of our <coughs> lives, man. <coughs> Because you don't want anybody to, you don't want power to to concentrate in one area. Historically, we know how that always turns out, and that's 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 what's that's in that sense. That's what I think is so incredible about the founding fathers is that they, they solved the political problem in that. Even people who are on the far left are using language that was, you know, essentially invented or concepts about liberty, about personal sovereignty, all these things. All these things were, were already thought about by the, by, the by, by philosophers and people who were, mm. you know, the, the, the children of those philosophers like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and Madison. And that's fucking really important mm-hmm. stuff. They were... They came up with something that works for us. It works. It's it's it's. You have so, to be very careful. So is this just a natural progression for us? Or are we just seeing the pendulum swinging one way? Do you do you are you have an optimistic view of this, or is this a scary time? Do you think? I think it's both. I don't. I I, I try to th- remind myself that you know America's always been a country where. Um, We've had debate and we've had left and right, and I think you need both. You know, Jordan Peterson said something really great about the left. He said, the right is, you, you need you need free markets, you need capitalism, you need competition. But, you know, there are people that fall through the cracks. And those people, they need help. And and they just can't compete. They're too fragile. I have, you know, I, I've loved people like this way. And, and sometimes you need a net. You need a safety net. You do. You need people who have bleeding hearts and you need social services and things. I, I really believe that. Um, so God bless both sides. Mm. The, where the, what, I, what I'm terrified of is not just the attack on free speech, which is so important. The way you combat free speech you don't like is with more free speech, in my opinion. What I really am worried about and I think is new is the fact that you can purify your echo chamber like social media allows you to to create your own truth, man. It's, and and those algorithms send you down a rabbit hole and that polarizes the fuck out of all of it us. Is, it is mob mentality now on steroids because uh, mm-hmm. the, the psychology of mob, and mob mentality we've known for a long time. This is why riots happen in sporting events or concerts. Mm-hmm. Um, but now you're online and now you can create that frenzy so much easier. You know, I mean, look, I, I'm old enough to remember when no one thought the earth was flat. All of a sudden you have the internet and now you can find enough people who think the same thing Dude, to I create have, a movement. Well, I have a podcast graphics. on Patreon and it's called the Conspiracy Social Club. Mm. I debate, I debate, I, I debate uh, conspiracy theorists, okay? I've had a flat earther on. <laughs> I've had a chemtrails guy on. How do you debate And I've that? had a guy about the occult in Hollywood. Uh, Patreon.com slash Brian Count. And the point is, uh, but, 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 um, but uh, uh, sneak peek on Big and Hungry Podcast coming to uh, coming everywhere February 7th, everybody. Big and <laughs> Hungry Podcast, me and Steve Byrne. Funny. Anyway, but sneak peek on Patreon. But, but I've, I debate these people, and dude, they're dead serious. Yeah. Oh, they're yeah. dead. I mean, I've had, and, I, and I'll- and smelling your phone too. I built a rocket and everything. Uh, but they're, they're also not scientists. They've not had any schooling in the field that they have these strong opinions on. Yeah. And, and it's to, no matter what you say to them, and I try to just ask questions, you're not getting anywhere with them. Yeah. There, 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 is a, there is a serious group of conspiracy theorists, and they take this shit very seriously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I don't even know what to say about it. I love doing it, though. I love debating them. I'm probably going to be kicked off- Vimeo or Patreon <laughs> yeah. soon because you're not allowed to be talking about conspiracy. Well, we brought you on, Brian. I mean, I've been a big fan for a long time, and we've listened to Fighter and the Kid, big inspiration for us. Thank you guys you. are like 
like the most honest uh, podcast we heard out there. And I was Try just me. like, yeah. And, and I just want you to go through this and like what happened and you know, what, what that looks like now. Uh, what, you mean fighter and the kid? Yeah. yeah. Fighter and the kid. Well, we, literally, went- we literally used to, when we started the show five years ago, fighter and the kid is one of our inspiration. Just the, yeah. the, the chemistry yeah. and the, the banter and the way you guys put well, it together. Well, what was so hard is like, so Brennan and I are still very close. Mm-hmm. We talk every day. And what was so hard was when you get, when you get canceled, when you get, when somebody just makes up mm-hmm. lies about you, you can't do anything about it anymore. And you have to just, you know, I, I went on the offensive and I was never going to be quiet about it because it's just, it, it was just insane. So um, I went on the offensive and I said, I'm not going away like everybody else. Fuck this because mm. I know who I am and so does everybody else I know. And, and so, but what happens is in, with cancel culture, corporations, your sponsors go, we can't. Mm. Right now, we just don't want to. We're we're afraid. Yeah, because it was you had an allegation, right? Yeah, and right. It, there was no evidence, no nothing. Just no, someone said something. Old. Twenty-one That's years it. old. Uh, yeah, like yeah. twenty-one years ago, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what was the first thing that happened when you? How did you know? Oh shit! This I is think it was like uh, like eight hours before that. My lawyer called me and said, "There's a, there's they're writing a story, and and you know you just hear that they're all you hear is that there are allegations. And when I read them, I went, "You're this is stuff I they said I said." You got to remember that that the 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 these two women said I said something. It wasn't even a nothing physical. It was some, what I said. And then a woman from 1999 had an an allegation, mm. and and I was like, and the first thing I said, I went, who? I go, that's not possible. It made no sense. But you don't know the the detailed story they're going to tell. You don't know any of that. You you if you if that was the case, I could have mounted an attack. I could have been like, this is fucking crazy mm-hmm. but all you can do when somebody does that and you have an activist who's a journalist because these people are activists they're not journalists right all you can do and they know who you are they you you're the enemy i speak too much mm-hmm. i talk too much mm-hmm. and, and and people know my politics i'm not even you know you can't even call me right wing i'm just a guy who believes in freedom and individual responsibility and those things i'm fucking socially liberal as fuck mm-hmm. you know i you know um but it doesn't matter you're you're i was lumped in with a group of people who were considered uh, problematic. Uh, that's what happens. And I was told that. Mm. I was told to shut up by people. Were you told that beforehand? Yes. Wow. wow. Yes, because I would voice my, I was told by some pretty smart, intelligent, powerful people. From the stuff that you would talk about on Fire Sure, and, and on wow. Rogan and stuff like that. And I was like, and I was like, really? fuck off. You know, I got nothing, I'm, I'm got nothing to hide. I've been a good guy my whole life. Yeah. Well, get, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, whatever the case, we can trace that back to, you know, Chris and I had a, Chris Lee and I had a show on Netflix. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you get lumped in with all this stuff. Mm-hmm. What happens is my podcast after seven years that I built, seven years, they go, the sponsors go, we, we can't, the, your agent calls you and says, this, nobody, nobody will sponsor right wow, now. Wow, like and that. And so my, my, my fucking brother- Like all of them? All of them. My brother, because everybody's got dirt. Everybody, everybody's terrified. Well, let, I'll, I'll explain what it is. It's like McCarthyism. But my yeah. brother, my brother, who I built a podcast for seven years, we had to walk away. I, I had to, to protect him, I had to get away because otherwise his sponsors would jump. Yeah. Wow. And so that's what fucking happens. And what happens is, listen, if you can come after somebody after 21 fucking years where you're like, what? Yeah. What? What do you, what do, you do with that? You, everybody. And, and, it's a ver- every and it's a verbal thing. I thought it was actually well, a physical. Well, no, no. For the, the, the 21 years ago was, a, was, a, was an allegation of uh, physical you know, assault. But but I mean again, what, you think I was walking around like do 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 like uh, uh, what, what do you think I got away with something? You think I'm a, a, a psycho? Right. Was I wearing a stocking over my head? What are you <laughs> out of your fucking mind? Yeah, you, there's no way to defend yourself against this insanity. So you're what, guilty until I mean it's it's yeah, like guilty every, until proven innocent. But every right? guy that you know who's a comic or every 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 powerful man in Hollywood, mm. everybody is including a lot of women who have husbands and sons and brothers. Everybody goes. They're terrified. Mm-hmm. If they can come after me, they can come after anybody. Mm-hmm. They just can. And that's, that's, a, that's a terrifying place to be because every guy goes like this. They go, oh, I dated a crazy, uh, that was a girl, a crazy girl in college. I wonder if she's going to, you know. She just say something. Right. Dude, 21 years later? Wow. So, are you kidding me? So, so this, 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 is what, this is when allegations become weaponized. Yeah. And, and don't kid yourself. It all goes away. And don't kid yourself. It's about murdering you. 
There, it's it, you, this is about murder. This is about when you talk about canceling people. It's a, it's it's what it really means is we want to make sure you never work again and you're on the street and you can't feed your children, you can't pay your mortgage. It's nothing other than that. It's nothing less than total and an absolute devastation. Mm. Don't tell me about you know if you're a real scumbag, if you're a Harvey Weinstein or a Bill Cosby. Yeah, man, I get it. I get it. The the evidence is too overwhelming. Fuck off. Get out of here. Go to jail. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, though, you 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 know, if people are getting canceled over a tweet, I'm talking about a tweet. Read the madness of crowds. A tweet, you you somebody put, and they, it was like I I I didn't think about it. I was fat shaming someone, but I didn't realize it. And you got to save your career sometimes. Mm-hmm. This is a very dangerous. Time. Now, did you did you did you have ownership in the show? And did you how did you yes. did you have to did you have to yeah. sell it or just no, no, bounce? No, no, no. I mean, I still I'm still you know I'm mm-hmm. still in it, but but it's it's. Uh, it's it's something that I worry about for my children. I worry about for everyone. Uh, this is this is something that, and I think a lot of people are worried about it. And I think yeah. most people can't stand this cancel culture shit. Yeah, I mean, I, that's all I hear. Yeah, you know, I, the the part I have a, I struggle with is, uh, you know, I've always been pro market response. Someone acts like an asshole, then people stop buying their products. Blah mm-hmm. blah blah. But it seems like with social media, what you have now is that mob mentality. Which what goes along with that is this. Virtue signaling. So to give an example, somebody says something and maybe it's perceived as mean. I'm going to jump on that person because I want everybody to know I think he's mean. And so you get this crowd. You get social capital. Yes. And yeah. you get this huge crowd. And Because I don't think with an allegation, if this were 20 years ago, no. any of that would have happened to you. But now it's like, oh, we're on the board. We're on board. Everybody now. But you got to fight back. You got to, you got to, you got to, you got to be, you know, if. The, the problem is a lot of people are guilty, so they they get they get they get quiet and they hide. Right. If you're not guilty, you got to fucking get out there and go bullshit. No way, you don't get to do this. Mm. Now, I'm not going away. I said it. That's why I made that 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 Instagram video. Yeah. I was like, fuck. Off. I'm not. And everybody was like, don't do this. I was like, get the fuck out of here. Mm-hmm. I I know who I am. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say this, and I want people to hear me say it. Mm-hmm. I'm not interested in like some little statement. I was told to like write a statement like uh, uh, I believe in due process and I'm a supporter of this that. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> nah. That I'll, you guys do that. Yeah. Not me. You're wrong. You're lying. I didn't I, and I'm innocent. So mm-hmm. how about that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to that's when you define yourself. You define yourself based on who you are when the chips are down and what you're willing to say. You you got to stand up for yourself. Now, did that did, yeah. that, did this attitude uh, happen right away, or yes. were you at first in uh, yes. shell shock? Okay. No, 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 no shell shock. I said to my god, I said to my lawyer and my publicist, I go, hey, you guys got. Why do you believe me? Why do you think I'm innocent? I'm not innocent. In, I'm not. I don't want to hire a gun. I want to know why you believe I'm innocent. And I had to hear from them because my my publicist is a feminist. I'm the only the second guy she's ever defended. Mm. And I showed her all my evidence, and I showed her all the people that came forward at in after for over the three day period after that, women, mm-hmm. women who came forward. I've known over twenty five years who were in my life, who are women I've been intimate with, dated, lived with, loved, all that stuff. The that it, it was crazy. It was crazy how it was unsolicited. I got it all on a file. I got it all on a fucking file in a Dropbox, and I sent it to to her, and I sent it to my lawyer. I go, you guys got to read every one of these. I want mm. you to read every single one of these because I want you to see who you're defending. I'm not interested in any other bullshit. I don't want I don't want a hired gun. You have to believe in your heart that I'm fucking innocent, one hundred percent. The shitty part is that it doesn't matter. But it That's, does at the end I mean, of the day. I mean, you it get, doesn't matter. You're right. I lost everything. Right. But but. I will I will keep moving forward. Right. I keep producing content. I keep fighting. Yeah. I keep saying fuck you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because this is not it's not right. Yeah. It's not acceptable. Due process. If you don't believe in due process and you think you can destroy people's lives over a rumor, over hearsay, over over saying that when somebody says you made a disturbing comment, I was never alone with that person. Never. Mm. Proved it. But they don't care. Yeah. So you got to you got to be full throated about that and say that. And and you keep you keep it's like my favorite quote by Michelangelo is criticized by creating. You keep creating. You keep mm-hmm. going. Mm-hmm. Keep going. So did you you started other <clears throat> podcasts, you did other projects. Yeah. Well, how Big and Hungry podcast coming <laughs> February 7th. <laughs> now, Patreon January 30 yeah. 31 32. Sorry. How's the reception been so far with the with the awesome. new stuff you're doing? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. 
because my the you don't you can't listen to somebody for seven years and not know who they are. I've mm-hmm. always been so fucking honest right. to yeah. the point where we wouldn't even accept sponsors on the podcast that we didn't believe in. Do you think your because from what I've heard about comedy for you know I've heard statements like it takes ten years of being in the trenches of of doing stand up and bombing and just going through that and before you become a good comic and I can't imagine it did for me well I can't imagine uh, how tough that would make somebody to be able to handle shit do you think your years of comedy just made you a badass in the sense that you could handle this let me tell you uh, this is for young people and anybody who's interested in mental toughness and stuff um one of the gifts of going through crisis and destruction one of the gifts of facing chaos is you know as men uh, I can only speak to men we if you're a certain kind of man probably every man in this room uh, you 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 want to build armor. You want to be ready for come what may. So we train, we work out. A lot of this is just building armor for for when somebody comes to take your fucking life. It really is. Mm. Like all of us know that at the end of the day, we're gonna have to fight for our life at some point. Hopefully, it's when you're really old and in your sleep. But for the most part, we know that this is what it's about. And so we 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 take our vitamins, we wear our seat, but we eat well. We you know we eat salad not because we like it, just because we think in our minds we're we're going to keep cancer at bay for a little while. We do all this bullshit. The problem is that when your chaos comes, it comes bearing weaponry you have no armor for. It comes in a form you've never even seen before. It comes in a way that you don't even know how to fight back on. You've got to improvise. Okay. And what's beautiful about facing true adversity and destruction is that you get very, if you're smart about it, and I say this to anybody who's facing something that's really tough, and I'm sure a lot of people listening are, because this is part of life. Listen to me. Just get very good at, forget mental toughness about, I gotta, I gotta bear through this. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Just get very good at refocusing your eye. You can look at what's wrong. You can look at, you can speculate on what's gonna happen in the future and how it's gonna suck. No, no, no. Don't do that. Just literally take the energy, it's just energy, and and just shift it about three feet over here and start looking at how you can make this work for you. It's just energy. Start creating. Get creative. Lost all your money? Start to, the, instead of thinking about losing all your money, think about a new a new opportunity. What's what's something the world needs? Start thinking creatively. What what can you do better that's not being done well now? Fortunes are made in crisis. You become a better person when you learn how to manage, how to speak to yourself, and where to focus your eye. It's very important. It's not about what to think about; it's what not to think about. Mm-hmm. Learn what not to indulge in. And I promise you, I promise you, you will, you will, it, there's something beautiful about sort of self-mastery in that sense. That's what self-mastery is, learning where to look. Where did you, where did you <clears throat> develop this, uh, this mentality? I mean, it's, it's definitely a winning mentality. I've heard it uh, echoed in, you know, different ways from different people. Uh, very successful people. Um, how did you develop this? Where did this come from? First of all, I forgot I was wearing this awesome bandana. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think just a lot of failure. I've had a long time to fail. I've had a long time to to not get it right. I've had a long time to live. You know, I've been alive more than half a century. No way, you look so much younger. <laughs> I know, thank you. I'm late on that said one, that over there. What's yeah. his name? Yeah. Yeah. Eli. Yeah. Eli said that. Thank yeah, you, yeah, Eli, yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> First thing he said is, your skin's so tight. And um, I know, bro, it's And then genetics. Sal said, you're so big. You know? I know, dude, I'm fucking taller than they thought. <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> my shoulders go on for days. Probably got a dick on me, who knows? <laughs> probably. Uh, probably, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll show you that yeah. later in the gym. But um, <laughs> yeah, but so I, I think I've just had a chance to fail. You know, and uh, and that's why I think people should always listen to me. I'm always like, don't listen to me because I'm smarter. I've just failed a lot more than you have. I've got better pattern recognition than you do. <laughs> Battle I tested, can, bro. I can see where you're 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 heading toward a wall. Why do I know that? Because I've crashed into that wall about 25 <laughs> fucking times. You know, my joke about success too is like. People are like, I did this interview and they were like, God, you've been so successful in Hollywood. Do you have any advice? And I'm like, listen, motherfucker, I'm I'm. I think at the time I was 50 or 51 and I was like, uh, and I was like, I had my own TV show, huge podcast, headlining all over. Yeah, making lots of money. Okay, cool. Great. Now listen, uh, this is the formula. You want to be successful in Hollywood? Okay, I'm just going to tell you how I did it. 
come to, uh, come to LA, uh, or no, go to theater school at 24 years old and then, uh, work as a temp and then somehow start doing bad stand-up comedy. And then I got a TV show, Mad TV. I was not ready for it. I just fucking was so desperate that I was so desperate to work. I was so afraid to be a failure that somehow I pulled it off in the audition room, got to the big dance and didn't have a fucking thing to say. Didn't even know I was terrible at characters. I was like, here I am. It was baptism by fire. I do Mad TV for two years. I get fired because I'm just not that good. And I wasn't, oh, by the way, it didn't work that hard. How about that? Didn't like it. Too much work. And, um, and then I spent really most of my 30s and... Like, I don't know, probably until I was, yeah, half my 40s, hearing the word no over and over and over again. I mean, and I'd get a job here and there, and then I'd, I'd, I'd you know, I'd hold on to that. But for the most part, getting TV shows that didn't go, you know, getting a, getting a movie and I got cut out of it. I mean, just no, no, no. The humiliation, waking up in the middle of the night, I'm fucking 35 and a failure. By this time, Jesus, Jesus was already dead. Alexander <laughs> the Great had conquered the world at 33. I'm 35. I'm a fucking loser. I worked in nine months. That's the kind. Oh, I'm 38. I'm 38. I'm jobless. Or I'm on a fucking show where I'm making no money, but at least I get to go work sometimes. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm you know, don't blink. I'm five. I'm, I'm in five minutes of that big movie. Movie. I just kept doing it. And and so finally I get, you know, finally, I think I'm 45 in my podcast. I get this, I meet this fighter who's a great businessman. And we just start doing that was my third podcast, people forget. Third. And it finally catches on because Brennan was Brennan Shop's a really good businessman. And we had this great chemistry. And I was just I'd had so much practice. By the time I was 51, yeah. Yeah, dude. It took me 25 Overnight fucking success. years. Overnight. That's, that's yeah. not even a success. And I, the joke is like if if a sparrow, if we stood out, you stood out here, and every time a sparrow flew by, you threw a stone at it. You'd hit us, you'd hit four in a year. You'd probably hit four in a year. If you threw a sparrow at, at a fucking stone at every sparrow that flew by, and then if you put them up on, you stuff them and put them up on this wall, after 25 years, how many sparrows do you think you'd yeah, have? 10. You'd have, yeah, maybe more. Yeah, yeah. You might have 50. I prefer yeah. to feed uh, the sparrows. Yeah. Thank, yeah that's well, that's because you're, yeah. I can tell that about you. <laughs> if you throw bread at yeah. the sparrow, how yeah. many would you feed? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I'm, I'm very happy with your with your quad development. You, he's got wow, he's got big quads, yeah. but he's a, he's a There's kind There's a lot man. more there. Birds <laughs> land on his shoulders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you walked in and you saw all those birds, this is a terrible metaphor, but you saw birds on the fucking wall, and I was like, Sal, how'd you do that? You'd be like, I, I knocked them out of the sky with a stone. And I'd be like, oh, you must be the best stone thrower in the world. And I'd be like, yeah, right. It only took me 25 fucking years to get that many sparrows on the wall. That's literally how I feel about my success. Yeah, and that's wow. how most people feel about their success. Mm -hmm. and, and success doesn't stay. It's not like now I'm a success. Get that. It, it gets harder and harder. Do goblet squats and pull-ups and run hills. As you get older, it only gets worse. It's not like, ah, goblet squats today. Let me bang. They fucking suck. <laughs> I like saying goblet so, squats. Hey, Brian, take me to, take me to like uh, the moment of, of Fighter and the Kid really starting to, to take off and evolve. What was that like for you? Like that meeting Brendan and then you guys hitting it off. And then when did you really know you had something? When, when Conor McGregor did the podcast and, uh, oh, I, remember and I looked at Brendan and, and he looked at me and he said, we just keep doing this. We just keep doing this. Just keep doing it. I mean, what do you mean? He goes, just keep doing this. What we're doing. That's all we got to do. And I remember, wow. And then I was, I was at the TSA guy. He said, the kid. And I was like, damn, we're getting recognized. And another guy was like, Brian Callen? I'm listening to your podcast right now. So you, you know, I'd be in the airports and, and people would start to recognize. Then you start selling out. Mm hmm you know, and, uh, how fast in, did the podcast get traction? Do you remember your downloads and things like it that? It took like, a long time. It's a progression. Yeah. It takes time, but you, you know, one of the things I notice about really successful people like Rogan, uh, is that, you know, Joe, Joe will tell you, it's not that he works hard. He's just really consistent. Yeah. If you're going to, if, if, if you, if he starts something, he's going to like, say he starts a martial art, he's just never going to stop. He's going to show up every single day. It doesn't matter whether he feels like it or not. He just shows up. It's not about time. It's not like um like like I, I working out's that way too. Like you can work out. You probably know this. You could probably work out if you're my age. You can work out twenty minutes every other day if you do it right. If you're lifting weights right, mm -hmm. you're you're going to be in shape. Oh yeah, a bad, a bad workout done consistently is uh, more effective than a good workout done inconsistently. There you go. Yeah. There you go. So 
I think everything is like that. There's not a secret to it. No, let's talk about podcasting for a second because it's a, it's a relatively new medium. Um, it's different than uh, previous media because previous media was so short. I think long form communication, I think a lot of people thought would never work. Um, every you know interview was 10 minutes, five minutes. There were sound bites. All of a sudden now we have endless uh, broadband. We could just talk forever. The hour, two hour podcast uh, became a thing. Different skill altogether, um, and arguably, um, you know, you got people who uh, lots of comedians, for example, who do so well on podcasts. Maybe not so well stand up, but the podcast works so well. What is it about the skill of podcasting? What makes it so different? Honesty. Mm. You have to be authentic, mm-hmm. and you have to. And, and I think uh, people really appreciate when you're going through shit. I always like I, I'm I'm always cognizant of the fact that I'm older now and I'm I'm the age of a lot of young men's dads and a lot of young men don't have we don't live in a culture that makes you feel good about yourself man or woman mm. you know we we live in a culture that that is, is trying to sell you something and the way you sell somebody on something is the fact that you're lacking this this is what's wrong with you but you know what what we want to know especially young men is how to be effective in the world where to place my energy how do I accomplish something how do I become significant. I don't want to be regular. I don't want to have to grind at this dumb job. I want to do something that makes me feel like I'm using all my talents along the lines of excellence. And and that that's and and sometimes what's really important is like that's why I say if you're a podcaster, make sure you immerse yourself in the best that's been thought and said, which is another way of saying read broadly. Listen broadly. Listen to people that you don't agree with. If you if you're if you're a Milton Friedman um, free market guy, listen to Mancuso. Listen to the opposite end of that spectrum. Listen to the left the the, the left wing intellectuals like Noam Chomsky. You might get something out of them. Read the Fifth Risk by by uh, Michael Lewis about where government is important and how big government actually can help. I I I had to I read that book and it changed my mm-hmm. goddamn mind. Mm-hmm. So so and the reason I say that is because. What I think people really appreciate with podcasting is understanding the difference between things, not the similarities. A mark of somebody who doesn't really do a lot of thinking is to say, ah, it's all just, it's all the same. Mm-hmm. It's just like that. No, I'm not interested in that. I want to know the difference. I want to know what the difference between this philosophy and that philosophy is. Yes. Mm-hmm. The difference between how how you train somebody and what your philosophy is and why it works versus this over here. Yeah, and, and speaking of uh, of that, uh, it, so we've seen so far other new media start to kind of clamp down on uh, opinions, different types of opinions, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and podcasting so far seems to be still very open and free it's the savior dude it, it seems that way it is. do you think it's next though do yeah. you think we're we're, we're next on the, on the chopping, chopping block, block next impossible mm. why it's very hard to first of all new technologies I, I have i've had three people uh big entrepreneurs come up to me with new new platforms anecdote the great thing about the marketplace and americans and people in general is that that if you start censoring things like parlor and all that i mean all anybody's talking about now is hey you can't be canceled on my new platform right so technologies yeah. are you know you, you, good luck good luck trying to silence the internet it's undefeated motherfucker yeah, yeah. so <laughs> you, look at reddit right now yeah. right what's going on with the stock Woo! market <laughs> oh. i mean you, you know, it's got its dark side but man you're not gonna th- these long form conversations where somebody who's made a lot of mistakes gets to kind of talk and you're asking me questions and we're all having these these conversations mm-hmm. and there's nothing toxic about this conversation i hope but this is just men trying to figure it out, you know, who want the best for everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, this is this is what goes on. So I'm I'm I am optimistic in that sense. I don't think that they can. I, I think <clears throat> it, censorship is always a threat. It's always a worry. But uh, technologies are coming about that are already taking all of that into account. Mm-hmm. So and if you have censor something, you just make the demand even more. Oh, yeah. You make mm-hmm. it you push against it. It seems to get stronger. The best it? thing that can happen to you is if you're thrown off a platform sometimes. Because you can turn that into, well, I'll just go over here and bring all my followers over here who are outraged by this. Americans hate censorship. Americans really don't like this shit. Yeah. They mm-hmm. don't. That's true. They're just, they just, this is, this, this idea of speech is violence and all that and sounds and violence, very fringe stuff with a bunch of, you know, real, really cloistered academics who are not good people. <laughs> They're not good people. 
Uh, they're, they're really not. They're they're damaged, traumatized, resentful activists. Yeah. They're not even scholars. Yeah. So Brian, we we've been doing this. We just rolled past our six year anniversary that we've been podcasting, and for sure, six years coming in here five days a week recording podcast. Uh, I, I think of these three guys as like family now, right? We're so close. We're so tight. And we talked about before you coming in here, like, man, I, I can't imagine being in Brian's position, like where I maybe something, cause I shit there. I'm sure someone could come out 20 years that I said something or did something when I was younger guaranteed, or whatever. Guaranteed. And I would be put in this position where, man, if, if I was going to go down, I, I would definitely opt out like to not the, the sponsorship side of our business is represents 50% of our income. Mm-hmm. It's a big chunk of money for us. Yeah. And if they were all going to walk away, I would. I would bow out f- for my buddies. But man, I think on the sidelines, it would be breaking my heart to see what's going on. Like, yeah. how does what's that like watching Shabby yeah. right now navigate? Especially I, all the fans like reaching out. Yeah, I see Brian? so many people yeah. that are yeah. so angry that you've left. That's been and, so overwhelming. That's yes. been amazing. It's been it's been it, you know. I, there's got to be a part of you that it feels good, right? Because so many people are like, "Fuck this show without Callan." But then there's a part of you. No, I want the best for. And, and look, it's not. It doesn't mean I can never go. Back back okay right? that's true mm. it doesn't mean that that won't eventually happen or that that's you know um but you know again you you have to like what is that the first rule of the the samurai miyamoto masashi's uh, 21 rules accept everything exactly as it is you have to do that and then you have to go this is what's going on right now mm. i must i must pivot yeah I, look i love that about life you're not a fighter listen to teddy atlas on rogan where he says, you ain't a fighter until there's a guy across the ring who looks at you and goes, I don't care that you can hit just as hard from both sides. You got to make me a believer. Mm. You're not a doctor until the kid's on your operating table bleeding from every orifice and you don't. there's nothing in the textbook that tells you how to fix this kid and you fix that kid. You're not, you're not a, you know, you're probably not a fully realized human being until you've come up against yourself and you're facing an enemy you don't know how to fight and you find your way through. Tom Brady is awesome because that motherfucker finds a way to win. He doesn't need Belichick. Hoorah! Right? He does, man. You're like, <laughs> God damn, you're yeah. 43. Yeah. yeah. And th- this is this is this is this is the challenge to always be embraced. It just is, and it could be way worse. It could be an aggressive form of cancer. Right. I could be a quadriplegic, man. Right. You got to always remember that too. Yeah. So, you know, it happened. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Let me find my way through. Yeah. Let me get better at, at managing my mental state. How's Shabby handling it though? It's How's, tough. Yeah, you guys talk every Dude, day. That's my brother. Right. Mm-hmm. We're close, man. Yeah. We're still close. We talk every fucking day. Yeah. So it's it's uh and Shab's a fighter. Of course. I mean, if if all comics were like Shab, uh and by the way, you know, this is another guy who started out as a comic and was like it'd be like me trying to fight. Yeah. He didn't, he was like, you know, it was, it was so new to him. Watch him now. Watch that dude now. You want to talk about a guy who just never stopped. Didn't matter who was criticizing him. His standup is fucking killing it. Yeah. It's, I can't even tell you what that made. It, it, it's so exciting to see. Did you he, coach him a lot? Did he, did he, I'm no, sure he turned to you. In no? the beginning, you know, I would, I would go over stuff, but to his credit, he pushed me away like that. He was like, I can't have you. Hmm. As my influence, because people are going to see you in this. All right. Oh, so wow. he knew that, Good and he, yeah, and he just stood on his own and just kept getting up, having people like me open for him. Hmm. You know, that's not that's, that's scary. Yeah, it you is. Know, not to be a dick, but I'm fucking really good. <laughs> Polished. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Miami, February fourth, fifth, and sixth. Everybody, fuck Miami Improv. Then I'll be in Nashville, oh, February eleventh, twelfth, and thirteenth. Zanies. But but, uh, but 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 whatever. Now, only if you like to laugh super hard. But um, <laughs> but you know he doesn't care. Yeah, he doesn't care. No. He's it, but, but there was a larger point to what I was trying to say. But um, yeah, well, we're so just that, talking that, about that how hard. he's probably feeling. I mean, I I, I can't imagine. Yeah, because the leave, chemistry you guys had was le- just leaving incredible. these guys and then whoever the dude is that comes in that would replace me. I got to sit back and watch that, and then I'm talking to them like, how's this guy doing? Is he right. fucking? I don't know if I could pay attention or listen in. Yeah. You know, it might be too much. You know, it was hard. Yeah, but like anybody else, like Shab doesn't stop. He's yeah. like, got to save the show. Let's go. Let's move. Always moving forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's all you can do, dude. Mm. Yeah. You, talk, you, you know. talk about being a, a family man. Talk about your how, how old are your kids? I got a nine year old and a twelve year old. So talk about being a father. I, I mean, all of us are dads. It's uh, you are all of us mm-hmm. are. Wow. Yeah, and uh, Adam's the newest uh, newest father. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, it's 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 probably the most challenging. If I had to think of the most challenging things I've ever done, probably being a dad, trying to be a good father all the time. 
Um, how was how was that during all this chaos? Do you go back and just hunker down with your family? Do you communicate this to the, are too are they too young to understand? You learn who your real friends are, and you learn mm. who your real friends are not. And you and what you do is you deepen your relationships. It it forces you to actually see the people that have been there the whole time. And there, that's another gift is that you deepen your like when, with my son who's nine. Like I work him out sometimes. Like mm. we, we we box. And, uh, and I'll teach him and he'll be doing pull-ups. It might be 15 minutes, 20 minutes, but that, that, that connection that you have with your son, uh, is my daughter's 12. That's a different story because she's, she's TikTok. I can't compete with TikTok <laughs> and she rolls her eyes at me and she's, it's, it's, you're you not know, got the moves down or anything. She's becoming a woman too. She's wearing mm. heels and makeup. I don't even, th- I don't know what the fuck to do. It's a disaster, but, <laughs> and I'm, I'm dad. So I'm just get away from me. You know, she's just like, get the fuck away from right. me. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. She barely, she can barely stand me. But um, that that in itself is a challenge because you just got to keep giving love. And she'll teach me about life. She's mm-hmm. she's an activist now, you know. And apparently, I, oh really? I, I, apparently, I'm warming the planet. <laughs> apparently, I'm privileged. Oh, wow. I, I'm like, you're welcome for fucking everything. Wow, <laughs> talk about how challenging that is having having. I know Sal has his kid who's really smart too. Challenges some of the ways he thinks. How, how is old it? Your, how old? Your well, name? my my son's uh, f- uh, fifteen. My oh. daughter's eleven. So you know that. Oh yeah. So, oh yeah. You go from being the coolest person in the world to being the just problem. embarrassing all the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, so you know. Well, my my daughter's a trans activist apparently now. And and, uh, she, you know, she's, she's, mm. she's, uh, the world, America's a shit show. And, and I'm just like, he's my fucking country. And, you know, and I sound like an old man. I'm, I'm, I'm an old conservative man compared to my daughter who's super woke, I guess at 12. Wow. And I'm like, you're, you're being indoctrinated by the socialists. You know, like, <laughs> I totally overreact. And she rolls her eyes at me as she should. And she knows things probably that I don't even at 12, maybe, maybe, or maybe she's, maybe we are headed for disaster. <laughs> And then I got my son, who I'm trying to make a man. I don't know what a man is in tw- in the 21st century. No, I, yeah. I, I don't know how to teach my son not to be a liability. You know, you're being taught that aggression and competition and wanting the best for yourself is toxic. And I have a problem. Well, you know, if you if you, really if you actually look at where like real toxic behaviors come from, uh, they typically come from not having a male role model. So it's almost like an expression of what they think they're supposed to be, or too aggressive, or whatever. Yeah. But just being there as a dad, you're probably going to have a son that's going to be a good kid. Just just being there, at least you that's know, what the statistics. That's show. a really good point. Is like I, I I was this guy who works with foster kids, and he's a he was a, my Uber driver, but he had his degree in like psychology, child psychology or something. And I said to him, um, "Hey, dude, I, I, w- w- you have any advice for me as a father? Because I got I got the my kids at the time were like whatever, and and uh, I said, do you have any advice?" And he looked at me, he goes. All I know is you just ask me for advice on how to be a good dad. Your kids are going to be just fine. Oh, because you mm-hmm. cared. Because I care. Yeah, you're there That's and you care. That's what he said. And I had another woman who was like this big psychologist. She was a child psychologist. And and I said, uh, I have a daughter. You know, my daughter was young. Go, Give me some advice. I don't know how to fuck to do this. And she goes, just don't leave. I was like, what? She goes, class over. So I, got yeah. I was like, oh, okay, dude. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. And so now my kids just know that I love the fuck out of them. That's all. That's all that matters. That's the yeah. most. That's the most important thing I think is show them love, and then maybe some discipline and structure. But even if you don't have that, the love by itself. Look, you want your children to have to be carried to your casket because their legs won't work because they're so full of grief. If your kids are sobbing at your funeral, it you should be congratulated by everybody around you. Your kids are fucking really devastated. Good job, dude. You're a, good <laughs> a terrible way. It's a fucking terrible way to you look at great it. If your kids today. are in dire pain on your <laughs> death, you did your fucking job. My goal is That's to make my, my kids crush. Yeah. My goal is die. to have my children not be able to eat for a yeah. month yeah. after my death. That, yeah. that means I did my shit. Yeah. Yeah. Kids are Lose sad. Weight. I got sparrows Lose on my wall. You know, I'm killing yeah. it. All the sparrows. Stare at the sparrows and weep. <laughs> <laughs> fucking dead. I hit those with the rock. Yeah. Right. That's Daddy's right. gone. Oh, that's that's that's. You're great. welcome for yeah. everything. You know, you 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 talk a lot about fitness and uh, you know uh, fighting. How, how long have you been into into fitness? You're obviously a fit guy. I see it in front of me. I commented on it when you came nice in. Body, yeah. Very yeah. Uh, <laughs> fucking shred. Extremely. He was waiting yeah. for that. Starting to question wait, wait, things. Wait, wait, yeah. you see my obliques. <laughs> They're just <laughs> dude. It's all about obliques. They're just lines. They just saw lines. My fucking hip muscles. My dance. <laughs> 
good. Oof. Great. Yeah. But you, yeah. how long have you been in, in, into fitness and in, uh, into fighting? I how just long, like, you know, when I was, I, I was the first thing I ever did when I was nine, I, I got into judo. And I, I kind of oh, got great sport. I yeah. love it. I did judo as a kid. Too. My teacher was an Olympic gold medalist, a Japanese guy in Saudi Arabia and uh, just giant Japanese man with a huge mustache. I'd never seen a man, a Japanese man that big fucking heavyweight. And, uh, and I, I was doing judo and I saw a small, his, another black belt, um, throwing a large man. And I was like, I want to do that. So I was obsessed <laughs> with Bruce Lee and shit. And then, um, and then I went to high school in, in Massachusetts and I wrestled. I was a wrestler. And wrestling fundamentally changed my DNA, and and then got into kickboxing and all that shit in college, and and then jujitsu, and I, I still roll, and I still box, and I still spar. You know, I, I there's something about sparring that I really like. Although I was getting dizzy, I, I haven't done it in three months or two months because, um, like I said to Shab, I go, I'm dizzy, and he goes, Yeah, dude, you getting paid for this? Keep it up. It's really bad for you. <laughs> but I love putting a mouthpiece in and a head, and just like it, it, again, I love that. That's something about fighting that, you know, I don't know, it just like makes me feel like I'm, or, or like I was doing, a, or like I work with this guy who was a, a Sambo, Greco guy. I love takedowns. I like, I like drilling takedowns. I'm fucking, I need a psychiatrist. I'm old. I was, I was practicing at a slip, my joke, but it's a true story. I was slipping. I was like, I was, because when you slip to the right, I get punched. I can never, like, I can slip to the left, but if I'm, and, and I was doing this, and my mother goes, What are you doing? I was in Utah visiting her. I go, I'm fucking, I'm slipping shots. Cause I, and she goes, you're in your 50s. And I was like, I know. But, yeah. She goes, you have to go yeah, to a like, psychiatrist. <laughs> she was dead serious. Yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, the thing I think I learned the most, because I did jujitsu and judo. And I remember the first class I took in jujitsu. This is after doing judo for a while. I rolled with the instructor who was this like skinny, you know, 150 pound Indian dude, purple belt. Yeah. And he tapped me out, I don't know, like five times in five minutes. And it was humbling. It was very humbling. And one thing I remember is in, in the class, you don't see a lot of big egos because no. everybody gets their ass kicked. All, and I feel like that's the most important thing you can learn is how to get your ass kicked and then be okay with it and not, you well, know, Well, it's crumble. also, it's also, it's not just getting your ass kicked. You also know that if there are no rules, that person could take your life. Oh, yeah. It's That's real. the other thing about rolling with dudes who are really good. It's like, oh, you could take my head off. You could kill me. You could take my head off my spine. Like, roll with Shab. That's no, my I'm, favorite I'm cool. thing. Yeah, <laughs> He'd be taking a nap. He would He's take, a big dude yeah. on top of it. He's 270. Oh, yeah. He'll tell you he's 250. He's trim 270. <laughs> they're, they're stronger than there's Brendan Shaw. Yeah. I've seen him deadlift. I've seen him deadlift 550 on a hex bar. Mm -hmm. I've seen him. He did that 10 times. 10 times. Like rep for reps. And then he did 10 sets of that. I saw that with my own eyes. Yeah. He did a Turkish get up. He put on a barbell. He put a 145 on and did a Turkish get up with that. He balanced it. And, and then he's he 270 it, pounds. Yeah. And then yeah. he did it with, <laughs> then he did it with uh, 165. And then he did 30 pull-ups. I saw it. So, oh, and by the way, when he was deadlifting, his brother told me he was bending the fucking bar. It's a different thing. And what I would do is he'd be taking a nap. We were shooting something. And he was taking a nap. And I get, he was like all tired. And I get fucking deep. I get a head and arm choke. And I sit my hips out like a <laughs> judo thing. I'm like, I, and I squeeze. And I'm like, now what the fuck, dude? Where are you going to go? I got a gable grip. And I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm sprawled out. And I'm on the bed. And I'm like, yeah, how about now? What? What? And he starts to giggle. <laughs> no. All he did was giggle. And he took my face. He just, with his hand, he took my chin and he peeled me the way you open a curtain on a Sunday morning when you have coffee. You know how you just go, I need some sunshine. Yeah. Just going to yeah, get yeah. a little sunshine on my face while I sit in my coffee. He went, he, 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 and he just went, mm, and I was like, oh, wait, my whole body. How are you, how are you bending me at the waist? <laughs> and he went, he go. And then he just brought his, his lazy leg, his lazy fucking oak tree for a leg up and kind of snaked it around my face again. And I, I got gene burn. I got gene burn on the cheek as he just fucking bent me backwards. It was a bad day for wow. old Brian. Yeah. So your, your judo slash kung fu slash jujitsu is no good here when it comes to Brennan shots. Mm. <laughs> and I've seen him do that with 300-pound black belt Samoans. Yeah. I've seen him do that with the biggest, best fucking wrestlers. Uh, when, 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 when he, the famous thing with Rogan, when he said, he, Rogan said, how would you do against those wrestlers? And he said, I think you'd be surprised. 
you'd be surprised. I've mm-hmm. seen him. I've seen him take the best in the world and pack a lunch. So speaking of fighting, what do you think about what's going on with uh, this movement that we've seen in the last you know few mm. years of uh, like influencers fighting big name people? Like, Look, what do you think about this? I like. I mean, I I wouldn't want to fight Logan Paul or Jake Paul. Those guys are like really in there sparring. Yeah. They're big. Fuck, I've seen. And they're big boys. Logan's a big kid. Yeah, he's a big, big athletic boy. Yeah, I mean, he's a big, strong athletic kid. He wrestled. Uh, I think not in college, but like he's he's never stopped working out. Yeah, he's never stopped training. And if you see him throw hands, yeah, you better pack a lunch. He knows what he's doing. I'm mm-hmm. not sparring that guy. <laughs> Fucking would never get in a ring with that guy. I mean, because he he's just too big and strong and athletic and young. And yeah. I mean, if he hits you, you're going to sleep. Yeah, it's not a good situation. I mean, watch Jake spar. Jake is taken or his brother. What's his name? Logan. Jake? Logan. Logan, but then there's Jake Paul who yeah. fought. Right? Yeah, Logan Paul, Jake Paul. Yeah, right? Jake, uh-huh. for, I, from what I've seen on Instagram, that kid is actually sparring and getting wobbled himself. Mm. I'm actually worried for him, but he's really in there and serious about yeah. it. I respect it. So I don't know. I mean, is he is he going to be a professional and fight? No, but well, the question I have is, do you think it's going to disrupt the fight game? I mean, you have hopefully right. You have something going on like with UFC where what Conor McGregor makes. I don't know what his biggest payday was in UFC, but then he yeah. goes outside of that and he fights someone yeah. like with it. Boxing's always been that way, you know. Fighting's always had you know Ali fought professional wrestlers and martial arts. That's guys. right. He fought that Japanese <laughs> yeah. wrestler, didn't he? That, yeah, it's always right. been that way. We always want to see that, but. The difference now is that these guys are actually in there banging and getting knocked out. Yeah, you know, like, Jesus. and they're and they're and there's a lot of money on the line. Well, yeah, now they have what I find interesting is now you have somebody like a, a Logan or Jake Paul who nobody would have known who they were if they were they'd have this social media following that they yeah. have, and that's a, they have enough millions of people following them that they can actually sell the shit out of. They're a making pay-per-view. twenty million dollars for this. Stuff. <laughs> I mean, yeah. God bless. And Jake Paul, I think, is serious about becoming a fighter. I respect that. Hmm. I mean, he's I, the fucking dude is actually making. Well, okay, let's see. So he's making millions of dollars, and he's challenging himself and being and one of the few people, one of the few YouTubers or entertainers or whatever he is, human beings, who's willing to actually get in the ring with uh, across from real athletes. That guy Nate, he fought it was a real athlete. Yeah, all oh, right, like a mm-hmm. sick athlete. Right, right. And he's willing to get in there and bang it, bang it out. And now he's challenging Ben Askren. Yeah, and yeah. those guys. How do you think that's gonna go? Well, it's I, just boxing, right? They're not yeah, gonna. They're not grappling. Because if it was if it was MMA, Askren, I think would dump him. Oh, right? of course. Oh, wrestling. Fucking, is you're not yeah. doing. He'll, he'll, he, if, if he touches you, you're good. Yeah, you're gonna. It's hit all. It's all over. Mm-hmm. Ben Askren, but I don't know that Ben Askren ever won a fight striking. I think it's all been wrestling mm-hmm. and then pounding. So, so I think it's a smart idea. Ben Ben's a great athlete and a, an Olympian and all that, but this is boxing, ladies mm-hmm. and gentlemen. Yeah, different yeah. sport. I, I don't think people really realize the difference between good and world class. I've I've uh, you know I've grappled with black belt, good black belts, and they're really good. And then I've gone against guys who are world class. And it almost feels like they could, well, I mean, it's just true. Like they could beat me while old, eating a sandwich and watching a TV show. Like literally with their eyes closed, they that's, could kick my right. ass. That's right. It's all it's completely different. It's a whole different yeah. universe. It, it's their job. And that's the other thing about, oh, that's awesome. You're good in practice. Good. Yeah. This guy's made the walk. This guy's made the actual walk. That's And, and that when when that's why I respect... Guys like Dustin Poirier, anybody who steps in the UFC and in the octagon, anybody who steps into the professional ring, because you to get there, you had to learn how to talk to yourself. You had to learn deal with injury. You had to deal with how to lose weight properly. Mm -hmm. You had to deal with a lifetime of disappointment, of the Mm -hmm. fear of. It's very different, and then they perform on that big stage. You know, you seem you're you're a good guy to ask this. You're you're very smart, uh, and uh, you know, I think you've been presenting this case pretty well. And what I always find fascinating is the more civilized and the easier we start to make life. I mean, let's be honest, in, in modern Western societies, it's just uh, life is physically just easy. We make everything very, very easy. And then we see the explosion of like Spartan races and all yeah. these crazy stuff, almost like we have to feel like we're almost going to die. It's a part of it's a part of being a human. Otherwise, we don't feel like we're alive. Yeah. Is that I mean, do you do you agree with that? Well, I think Freud said if you take away competition, if you take away war uh, of some kind, uh, man will kill himself. You know, we'll we'll turn that aggression back on ourselves. Wow. You, aggression is is competition imposing your will, whatever it might be, is is that that will to power is so fundamental to human beings, men and women, by the way. 
It, 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 it just is. So, you, you know, when you, when you no longer have a way to express your masculinity, when you no longer have a, anywhere to place your aggression, uh, which is so fundamental to human, you know, the human experience, it will manifest itself uh, in, it will have to be simulated some way. Sport's a great place for it. You don't want it being done on a battlefield with actual weaponry. Oh yeah. You want it. You want it expressed as entrepreneurs. You want it expressed in the in the in the marketplace as competition. You want it expressed uh, in in a ring with a ref, uh, on a field with a ref. This is this is this is what's beautiful about aggression. You know. You, you know the uh, the movie The Matrix. There was that one scene where they have. Uh, I think it was Morpheus, and they mm -hmm. caught him. And they're trying to get into his brain to crack the codes for you know wherever Zion or whatever. And uh, Agent Smith uh, says, you know, we we made a perfect matrix at first. It was it was a utopia for humans, and we lost entire crops because the human mind could not perceive a world uh, they, without challenge and without you know yeah. death and destruction. I thought that was such a brilliant. Uh, Do you brilliant believe line. though that we're building towards that right now, and that's part of why we're getting such a pushback with our society? Think about what we're doing. We're making things easier and easier, and before long, some people believe that anything that can be free will be free in the future. I have you ever heard the theory that you know, like these theoretical mathematicians and physics physicists are talking about in terms of like, so we know evolution is 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 been the order of the day, and that's if you believe in science, you believe in evolution, and there's a overwhelming amount of evidence for that. Then you have Newtonian physics, you know, the kind of physics that we live in. Mm -hmm. This is you know matter, but then there's quantum mechanics quantum physics which is how electrons work and weird but they're two different realities right because one one kind of contradicts the other sometimes mm -hmm. and einstein and all these physicists have been working on what's called a theory of everything which is this what is the bridge what is the theory of everything? The unifying theory yeah and it's it what i what i think one of the ideas is one uh, that this might be well we may already be self-replicating machines so that this is no this is we, well, how, how many layers deep you think we are in this reality well, in this simulation well, well, that's you know? what i mean is that we might be already on a loop we're controlling our own evolution we're controlling our own biology we're kind of synthetic biology nanobots um uh gene editing so that pretty soon we're going to be able to create creatures we're actually going to be able to create the cross between a lion and a man i mean this is not if you extrapolate 20 years 30 years this is not far-fetched this at is all. not far-fetched at all what what and, I, and, I think and, China aren't they doing chimeras or all whatever? of that stuff now, now now exactly and now think about also also uh, virtual reality right now it's very crude crude and rudimentary okay but if just extrapolate fifty years from now what is virtual reality going to be like like this you're going to have a real reality this might already be a virtual reality mm -hmm. this may our brains the real sal the real the, you know we, the might be in a, it might be like the matrix this might already stat, statistically there are mathematicians and physicists they think who are it's more of a probability about, right well and and this this might be machinery this might be and we're making better versions of ourselves already. So we're the, okay, better this is a perfect time to talk about conspiracy theories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. I, okay. I want to get into this. Like, so you have a whole podcast around this now, and I'm sure you've come across some amazing theories for, uh, and things that you've come across. What's your favorite one so far? I mean, uh, they're all so far fetched that none of them are my favorite. What I, what I think is interesting or is most that ridiculous. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no, but like about entertaining. How, um, flat Earth. Okay. I mean, that's the most incredible thing. I, I talked to this flat earther, and he was telling me that there was an ice wall around the world, an ice wall, just like Game of Thrones. And I said, "Well, well, when you chart your flight pattern, my dad <laughs> was a pilot, and you know, and when you chart your flight pattern, you take into account the." curvature of the earth and how you i mean this is all done and he said yeah i know a lot of pilots are starting to speak out about this <laughs> uh, and i go so nasa is having people just fly in weird circuitous routes just to keep this globe myth going yeah he goes yeah and i go they're all huh, in on it huh. <laughs> okay and has anybody been what's beyond the ice wall he goes nobody knows and i was like ah mm. so we don't fly past that and i go where do the people who want us to who's controlling all this he goes hey who's running 
Costco, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> was that what a great was, response. Uh, hey, was that the defense? And I go, That's I go, I go, defense. do you have a degree in anything <laughs> concerning <laughs> geology or astrophysics or anything? No, goes, dude, oh, YouTube. do I have some lying bullshit degree? No. I'm like, oh, it's all a lie. <laughs> okay, I guess everything that's in my cell phone is also a lie. Like, if you start asking them questions, they're like, you believe in scientism, and they'll hit you with this. But the problem with the, the real conspiracy theorists is that and the, when I see them, I'm like, well, you, you're not, you're not, you literally have had zero schooling in this field. Mm -hmm. And then they'll say things like, I'm just asking questions, man. I just doubt. <laughs> I just right, do research. Right. That's yeah. all I do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I just watch videos. Really? So all those, like, it's like the chemtrails thing. I was like, so... So this is a, anytime you see chem, anytime you see anything coming out of a plane, it's a chemtrail. Yeah. I go, who's running this? It's a worldwide thing? Yeah, 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 it's worldwide. Huh. And would any environmentalist be a little up in arms about this? Or are they all in the dark too? Or are they all in the take? And any yeah. investigative journalist say, is it only you guys, you <laughs> small group of people that just seem to have the truth? The enlightened ones. It's fucking fascinating. You know, yeah. you know it what? It just seems like, it, like last year especially, like it was at its ultimate peak. Like I, I've never seen so so many conspiracy theorists think all of a sudden everything's unveiling and this is all happening and yeah. this is like... Well, you have to believe that, first of all, human beings can keep secrets. And they don't. <laughs> yeah, and, and then you have that. to believe that people are that organized. You know, this this venture capitalist was uh, tried to get... Um, I, think it was, I think it was my buddy who's made more money than God. And, and he tried to get like five... Uh, <clears throat> This venture capitalist wanted to raise crazy money, and she she wanted to get five of these billionaires at lunch to present her thing. She couldn't get any of them to. These are very powerful people. She couldn't get any of them to meet with each other because they all hated each other because they were all suing each other. One banged the other one's wife. They were like, they all run the same. They're like, fuck you, fuck that guy. I'll never do business. She couldn't even get them to sit down. Because of course not. This right. is human beings. But they all work together to, to keep the conspiracy alive. Yeah, right. We're, we're, we're tribal. Yeah. That's the problem with the idea behind all of it. It's yeah. like, yeah, and if you're a good conspiracy theorist, or if you're good anything, you want to always have, and, and I think, uh, I think um, Eric Weinstein said this, Wokistan and Magistan are both, um, they both have elements of truth. And then it's filled in with a bunch of craziness. So, oh, totally. So you always want some truth. Yeah, that's the only way it gets laid. Use, use truth, rooted. use some of the truth to get your point across. And then you just, you cherry pick the data. Mm, so oh, how do you explain Epstein Island? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I think, that to me, I think uh, Epstein was probably working for a foreign entity. Mm. And I think that this Mas foreign the Mossad. entity, let maybe let's say that that is Israel, and Israel said, "I know how to get, I know how to get influence over really powerful men, men like banging women, and and powerful men who happen to be married. Uh, let's put them on an island. You get these gorgeous women out there, and you videotape it, or you just get, you know, you get it on camera somewhere, or you just have dirt on them. Mm -hmm. That's a really good way to get influence. Right, That's a, yeah. uh, that makes sense to me. Like you know." It seems like it's like this is a great way to get people, you know, blackmailed. Yeah, and the way he died, I mean, could they have made it any more obvious? Like all the cameras shut off. Nobody knows what happened. He killed himself. Oh, yeah. really? It's just weird. Yeah, I didn't follow that, but, uh, you know, uh, maybe that's what happened. I, 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 look, if it was the Israeli Mossad or – but then again, also, like, why, uh, what's his name? Epstein didn't have anything to live for, did he, though? Mm. What was going to happen to him? He was never getting out of jail. That's true. Mm -hmm. He was never getting out of jail. He probably was never going to be able to be in general population. Uh, so killing himself would have made sense. It's not surprising to me that he killed himself. Mm. It's also not surprising that he had tried it already. Did they fail the first time? Come on. Yeah. Mm. I, I that, mean, that's my thing about it. Like he, yeah. he, he, he tried it the first time. And then he was on suicide watch. Mm. So did the Mossad fail the first time? I don't think they yeah. failed. Well, what's that saying? If you see hoof, hoof prints in the sand, think horse, not zebra. So it's usually the obvious exactly. uh, answer, not, exactly. the, not the crazy one. Exactly. You know, you, you talked about a lot about competition and how it's natural. And I, can, I assume there's a competition in the, com in the comedy world. In the stand-up comedy world, I don't think how so. does that surf? I was just going to ask you, what does that look like, or is it just a lot of camaraderie? Yeah, I don't. It, comedy's so it's so its own thing. I've never thought of it as competitive. I don't know how you compete with comedy. All you can do is write funny stuff and get up and be funny. And if it's funny, people laugh. But I've never ever felt that any of the people I know 
from Bill Burr to Joe Rogan to Chris D'Elia to Sam Tripoli to, you know, I mean, uh, any of any Anthony Jeselnik or and they, uh, they're all doing their thing. They're all up there. You know, you do your set, you crush a room or you don't. And then you go back to the drawing board. You're too busy writing and trying to come up with new things and writing your one hour and perfecting it. I don't know how you compete with that. It's like, ah, I beat you. Yeah. My, my, I mean, I've had friendly competitions. I used to do this with Chris D'Elia all the time. Like, I'd get off Oh, I stage. love the way you guys talk yeah. shit to, to each other oh, on Instagram. Yeah. That was the great. I, I, we still do. I mean, I, I would get off the stage and I'd be like, like one time I, I did, uh, we had this competition to see who would make people laugh the most at the Laugh Factory. And he went up and then I went up and I, I, I did, you know, um, mm, mm, really funny. <laughs> but so is Chris, right? But no, but we we both kind of did. We, we killed. It's a packed room, and we mm. did our thing, right? And so at the end of my set, I looked at Chris and I go, "Hey, Chris!" And he was this there, and I go, "That's how you do it." <laughs> and the whole fucking place went crazy. So in that sense, it's a fun, but gee, it's not like a race. Mm. Who, who, who's your favorite comic right yeah. now? Who do you think are some of the the, the greats? Uh, I that love are, I love Bill Burr. Oh, so I mean, he's, he's got to be my favorite. I mean, one Sebastian of my makes me laugh so yes. hard. Mm. You know, um, you got to give Dave Chappelle his due for just telling oh, the yeah. truth. Dave Attell is yes, a Dave beast. Is my favorite. Dave Attell is the funniest motherfucker. I mean, it's just this pure comedy. Uh, I think Louis C.K., you know, I, I was listening to him recently. I, I never used to listen to him much, but God, he's fucking a killer. I, I, I've always loved Kevin Hart. He's gotten so rich now, but, you know, Kevin's, you know, I don't know. I mean, I like I like the people I know. I think they're all... Mm. I think they're all how, how are how are comedians in uh, in general with business? Because uh, you you mentioned Kevin Hart, like one of the things that I think about his brilliance isn't just his stand up, but is also his brilliance as a businessman. Like I think he's kind of paved the way for a lot of comedians. Is that true, or what do you what do you think? I, I think that yes, I, I, you know, I think that podcasting and it's it's for the first time really it's you can make a lot of money as a comic. That used to be not the case. It's very rare that you could actually sell 3,500 tickets or something. Now you can. Now you can sell 6,000 tickets with podcasts, and it's really allowed comics mm. to reach a much broader audience. Mm. Um, so uh, and then you've got your Netflix stuff. And so I, I think um, this is a new thing. So business has – business being a businessman selling merch, it, it's kind of the rock star – uh, model of yeah. things, um, but I think that's fairly recent. I, I don't. Does think that feel people... weird? Is that for someone like you who's been in the business for so long to like transition that way? Like... Well, I mean, yeah, I, I remember. When, I remember when the comedy store wasn't the comedy store when there were twelve people in the room, and then Rogan's podcast and and all of us doing podcasts talking about the comedy store. So people from all over the world were coming to the comedy store. So I would have somebody from Pakistan calling me Mr. Callan and being all like just so excited. Uh... It was fi or India. I'd be on a plane and somebody from Mumbai was like, are you on How I Met Your Mother? And you, you just stand up. And, or a guy from Sweden said, you're on my screensaver. You're like, what? Yeah. What? <laughs> all because of podcasts, all because yeah. of social media. So that, that's very new for us. Yeah, one thing that surprised me uh, when I was younger, meeting uh, comics uh, was uh, how intelligent uh, they all seem to be. You, you don't necessarily see that when, they, when they're on stage and doing their, their, their act. Obviously, they're funny. Um, but you talk to them afterwards and you just, they're highly intelligent. Is there a correlation between, uh, you know, being very smart and also being a comic? I, I, I would assume there is because you have to observe things and be able to present things in ways that are, uh, that are funny that people are used to. I don't know if you're smarter, but I think what happens is if you're a comic, typically you're doing that because nothing else worked out or that's the, <laughs> only, or, you know, I mean, really, or that's the only thing that really, that, you know, you, you have to be to some extent a misfit. Mm -hmm. I don't know any comic that's not a bit of a misfit, that's not a very dysfunctional in one way or another. And I mean all, all comics. Mm -hmm. And I think what that really is is, uh, is having this ability to be on the outside looking in. You know, uh, It's like I don't know too many fighters who didn't come from some kind of a broken home. Sure. And I don't know too many comics that didn't come from some strange, unorthodox beginning you know it's like dove davidoff who, one of my favorite comics it was talking about how his dad was a you know his dad smoking crack in the fucking in the bathroom and his mother at one point was gay living with a woman underneath like in the basement of the house and the woman had a pet monkey and you know I mean, his father wow. was like i was gonna have your mother killed but i could never do that to you and your brother that's it that's what he said that's how he that's as close as he got to killing <laughs> so he became his, a comic his dad be smoking crack in the bathroom he goes dad where dad i need to use the bathroom he goes 
uh, um, I'm in the garage. And he's like, I can hear your voice. He goes, not your father. He's like, well, tell my dad, whoever it is, to get out of this garage slash bathroom. And this is real true stories about that. So so much of what um, makes you a good comic and makes you a comic in the first place probably is the fact that you came up differently, that you were always on the outside looking in mm. there's something really there's something about that 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 causes you to be more of an observer and you tend to get perspective on what's weird what's wrong what doesn't make sense mm. you're not orthodox mm. you what, don't go into comedy if you're what was that for you what was that for you uh growing up all over the world oh i i, I lived in seven different countries until i was 14 so i oh. was born in the philippines and then i moved to calcutta then then bombay now mumbai and then we moved to lebanon then pakistan then lebanon again the war broke out we got evacuated to greece and then uh and then saudi arabia so by the time i was 14 i had lived in all those countries and traveled even more than that to russia at the time when it was communist to China when it was very communist. Everybody's wearing the same outfit and riding bicycles. I mean, I saw all these things. I saw real poverty in Africa, real poverty in Pakistan and India. Um, I was too young to remember India, but real poverty. I mean, real. In Yemen, I went to Yemen and I'd never seen, I, I saw leprosy. I saw people with leprosy, like advanced stages of leprosy, which we don't deal with anymore. So it gave me such an appreciation for this thing called the United States. It made mm. me such a patriot. By the time I was 14, I was like, America, I never lived here. Mm. And I was going to boarding school. But what made me a comic was I was, every year and a half, two years, I was thrown into a new group of kids. And the way you make friends is you 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 kind of become. Luckily, I was coordinated enough to be okay at sports, and but mainly I was like, hey, I know how to get people to like me. I'll make you laugh. I'll make a spectacle of myself. I'll be a fucking idiot, and you guys will laugh. And that's literally, I think, why stand up is so natural for me. Do you think it, you think it was like a lot of self depreciating humor? Is that how you started? Was yeah, it? always. I never liked myself. I mean, listen, you, you know, this idea that you have to like yourself is such horseshit. Low self esteem <laughs> is a good thing. <laughs> it is. I'd never be funny if I liked myself. I was yeah. built like fucking muscles over here. <laughs> Seriously, like I've always wanted. I'm, I'm, all my humor is about the fact that I didn't grow up to be a big, strong, muscular, handsome fucker. You know, you know, you can't like yourself. It's like low self esteem is how. It, is is where a lot of you should have a sense of your own inadequacy a profound sense of your own inadequacy because <laughs> everything is a fucking compensation and, and and i'm serious i mean that 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 is not necessarily a bad thing stop you don't have to i hate when i believe in yourself the fuck out. believe in myself all right tell you what bro i'm gonna put you in a ring uh, with John Jones, he's going to kick you in the head. Do you believe in yourself right now? <laughs> the way you believe in yourself is through training, practice, and you only believe in yourself under very strict, narrow confines. Put me up in front of a group of people with a mic, I'll believe in myself because <laughs> I've been doing it forever. Mm -hmm. Put me in a ring against a guy who can really bang, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run away or pretend to faint. <laughs> I don't believe in myself. I don't believe in myself in a lot of things. Oh, man. That, that's, that's, that's not. I, I always, when I see comics, I always think of how uh, courageous they are because you know when they when they ask people uh, what your number one fears are it's always public speaking is kind of one of the top ones and it's really the fear of people rejecting you and as a comic you, you especially in the beginning you, you go up there and you probably suck a lot what does it feel like to get bomb roasted. Yeah, what does it feel like to bomb in front of a group of people is that just terrifying yeah, and does it ever get easier i have it on tape somewhere the first time i ever did stand up and um have you ever been in a real fight where you don't where the guy you you're gonna get your ass kicked? You're like when you're in a real fight, mm -hmm. like you're, all this all your jujitsu and all that shit. You're like out the window. <laughs> you, you you anchor your back foot and you're like I'm gonna go with this dude and he's bigger and stronger and I don't know if he's gonna bite my face. I'm fucking terrified. You're like I've been training all this time and I can't feel my legs right now. Here goes right, mm -hmm. and that's an awful feeling, right? You're just like everything's like nobody wants to talk about that, but I don't give a fuck who you are. You're always terrified, and I don't care if you're an MMA guy. If you're in a real situation like that it's always like of course. you're so afraid it's natural i was more afraid than that the first time i got on stage like i couldn't move my face dude I, and my voice yeah. was really high and i was trying to do something and i blanked i blanked in the middle of my set no. i sure did and then i fucking came back and did it and, and i i, I this, the what, first two times were baptism of fire what made you go back because i knew i had it Mm. because I was funny even the first time. Not to be a dick, but 
I was. <laughs> fucking good. I yeah. was. I was. Yeah, that's what I, I think, made to I do. I think you have to get a little bit yeah. of that. Don't you feel like it? Don't you feel like to keep you going, you have to get a little taste of like, okay, I think I could figure this yeah, out. I was always making my friends laugh. Right. You know, I was always making my friends. They were all telling you, you were yeah, so fucking dude. funny, yeah. man. Yeah. But it's like being the tough kid in the neighborhood. And then you go to American <laughs> Top Team and go <laughs> fucking roll around with those guys and see what happens to your face. Yeah. You know, so, so you know, there's something called professionally funny, but I knew I could do it. Yeah. I, I knew that I was never going to be a great actor and I was never, I was, you know, I was okay at acting. Mm. You know? T- talk to us a little bit about Hollywood. Is it, yeah. uh, I mean, we, Justin was a little Do they little all worship Satan? Yeah. yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. let's get into it. Well, they do. They all worship Satan. <laughs> Um, I knew it. Do they drink you, the blood of children? You must drink the so blood right? of traumatized children because there's adrenaline running through their yeah. blood. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that stuff is... No, uh, uh, Hollywood is, um, is, is a business like anything else and uh, acting is always so precarious and there are so many people that are great for five years. Who was it? Jay Leno who said, it's a matter of time before you're the last guy in the chair. It's a matter of time. You're, you're a movie star now but then you get three movies that don't go so well and people forget about you and you're put in movie jail. And now, I mean, now Hollywood's so different. Oh, there yeah. are no movie stars anymore. Yeah. There aren't. There are YouTube stars and it, Netflix. It's just uh, My kids is, don't even care. Yeah, dude. The, 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 the age of Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise, I think, is probably over mm-hmm. because there's just too much out there and, and you don't need stars anymore. You just need good actors. And the movie is the star. Yeah, mm-hmm. I would agree with that. I mean, my kids don't even, uh, I, I could ask them to name a Hollywood star and they couldn't, but they could name 10 yeah. YouTube PewDiePie influencers yeah. uh, you yeah. know, uh, right, right away. And that is, those are the new stars, but how long do they last? You know, that's that's a very fickle thing. But, you know, that, the beautiful thing about YouTube is you don't need any, you don't need this machine. When I was coming up, you needed a machine. Yeah. You needed a publicist, a lawyer, a manager. Yeah, good you, point. They, they, you needed this whole infrastructure and you saw a third of your money for real. You saw a third of your money. You, you didn't see if you, you made if you made a million dollars, you know, you were you were kind of, save your money. There's a reason most actors are broke. Because it just goes. It's it's not, you know. Especially if you're trying to live in Hollywood, too. Yeah. <laughs> but for the first time, for the first time, you have control. For the first time, your phone can make you a millionaire. It's kind of crazy. It's mm-hmm. it's really weird. Well, I Brian, I, there's no doubt in my mind you're going to come back with a vengeance. Uh, Thank I think you, you just, yeah. you have, the, I mean, your attitude, obviously you're talented. I, I, I think you're phenomenal. What is it looking like for you in the future? You're starting a podcast. You're doing more stand up. Anything else people should look out? Look I'm going to focus on on this new podcast, Big and Hungry, um, that I'm doing with Steve Byrne. is a great comic, and uh, and I'm going to focus on that. I'm going to continue to do this Patreon thing with the Conspiracy Social Club until they kick me off, and that's been <laughs> so much fun just to argue with these people. And I'm just gonna and I'm ready to sh- like release my next special. You know, I'm shooting it in Miami, in fact. Uh, February 4th, 5th, and 6th, improv. And then uh, and I'm going to shoot that, and then I, I'm back to the drawing board. I'm never going to stop writing. I'm never going to stop trying to surprise myself because I'm in the business of original self-expression. And I think that's needed more than ever now. And as I get older, I just try to stay as fair as I can. I try to keep good ideas out there. And doing podcasts like this is always a privilege. I appreciate you guys having me out here. Oh, bro, of course. Yeah. Yeah, Brian, you, You're before, one of our favorites, before we hang out, though, I, I wanted a question about this because uh, this has been something that uh, has been on my mind. My, my, I've changed the way I look at things. Much of my motivation early on was to, to reach this point of success, financial success. When I got there, it totally sh- shocked me that I was unhappy and it wasn't what I thought it would be. Were you ever driven that way, were you driven for money? Were you driven for success? And then did you reach it? And did it did that change for you? Or is it it's a funny question? You know, I, I when I was about a year ago, two years ago, I drew a line through everything I'd ever tried to accomplish. I came to LA, and I had a list. I was specific about my goals, and I drew a line through every one of them. I did everything. I lived my goals, and I'd accomplished everything. And um, what I thought was interesting is that I think in life you need a certain amount of certainty. That's a good thing about money is that you need to know that you have a roof over your head and you need to know that you have food and you, you know, that, that stuff's important and that you can give too. That's really important that you can pay for a meal and that you have a car and those things are really important. Um, but once that happens, um, now, now what are you going to do? I think you need adventure, adventure. There are two things that are really two commodities that are always, I think, scarce adventure and intimacy. Intimacy is something you get when you you guys have it among yourselves. You have it with the women in your life, hopefully. 
um, you, you know, but it's rare, isn't it? Intimacy somehow is that that feeling of um, deep understanding, deep connection with somebody, and and soldiers have it when they go to battle. Athletes have it when they're on the same team. You guys have it when you're trying to build something, whatever it is. You know, usually a mission and trying to accomplish that mission creates an intimacy. You face plateaus and adversity and things like that. But boy, is it rare. And it's it's you. you a lot of times you find out you get real intimacy in crisis. You know. And, um, and the other is adventure. And the way I define adventure is not knowing what's coming next. And you need some uncertainty in your life or you'll get bored. You right. need some danger. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and always bring it into your life. And the way to do that is to do things that you're not so good at. It's humbling, but it's awesome. And it keeps you uncomfortable. And it keeps the ribs on you. And I think that's very, very important. You can get very stagnated and stale in the same gym with the same patterns. And I think it's really important to change your patterns up and learn something that you haven't done before and, and practice a skill that scares you. All of us want to do something that we're not doing. What is it? You know, and, and do it. I think that's, that's probably the best way to mine who you really are. At the end of the day, it's about learning about who you are, learning more about yourself. And remember this too, that, you're, that life is one continuous mistake. And it's just about... <laughs> adjusting and adjusting and there's a great there's a great saying that mark hansen said in uh, the subtle art of not giving a fuck he said instead of asking what you want ask yourself what you're willing to struggle for excellent mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. excellent great way to end it Love brian it. thank you so much for coming on the show man yeah, yeah. thanks for having me yeah, yeah, yeah. brother thanks you guys again. Are great awesome. time right i appreciate on. it